The question is, how do you discern between peripheral and central sensitization? And my answer is, I don't know. Um, and if I were seeing somebody in in clinic and they seemed sensitized in some way, I'm not sure that I would really care all that much because they're still sensitized. They would still have triggers, things that would piss off something and things that would hopefully make them feel better. Um, they would still have a, um, a history of, of those symptoms. And this is, again, assuming that no red flags are present. You know, we don't have any sort of weird systemic things going on. So I wouldn't really care that much. I don't think I'd assess any differently. I don't think I'd treat any differently, whether I had a diagnosis of centralized or central sensitization versus peripheral sensitization. I'd care more about what they can tolerate right now. I still care about what they want to do and where they currently are, and then try to figure out how do we get them closer to where they want to be. And just recognize that the same rules probably apply where you know, we're, we're probably going to get some some flares. It's probably not damaging. It's probably okay. Let's set that expectation to progress the way we normally would. So let me turn it over to you guys. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I I feel like I knew we were going to pick that one. <laughs> it seems chock full of stuff. <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting to me coming from like just reading you know, the research on and reading Explain Pain, Explain Pain Supercharged, and uh, they talk about these concepts a lot. And um, I'm not denying that they're not real, but I, I think what's always kind of hard to conceptualize and maybe step back and kind of take in the big picture is that like all these things are like models. So like we're we're trying our best, like and that's what science does, is that we just kind of reduce things to its parts and then try to build it back up into like a model that makes sense so that we can like learn from it, teach other people, and hopefully it can like kind of progress our knowledge forward. Um, and so with this peripheral versus central sensitization, like I, it's, it's one of those areas where I think it may have to do with, it's a really great research topic and it's a great way of understanding more of what's kind of going on under the iceberg. So I kind of use this like iceberg analogy where like what you need to know to kind of pass on to the patient and what like you need to know to actually effectively like know the information. And that it might be one that might, it might be one of those topics that like it just doesn't come across well that clinically. And I could be wrong, and I I've seen some Twitter arguments over this on how to like treat certain neuralgias and things like that, and that may be indicated. But when I have a patient in front of me, I think like it's kind of almost like this catch twenty two with that like I think pain science and this whole biopsychosocial approach is kind of taking this more whole wholeness picture and if we start like kind of going down these routes of like trying to dissect out peripheral versus central sensitization we're kind of making the same mistake we did with like spinal biomechanics it's kind of like you learn spinal bio spinal biomechanics to like know how the spine moves but maybe you don't need to like extrapolate that reduce it to its parts and like kind of use it as something to treat in the moment and so i i try to I try to always check my bias with this kind of stuff because I don't want to make the same mistakes I made in the past with uh, being too reductionist. And so that's, that's kind of what I think when I um, approach that topic. Now, if I wanted to like speak even further about it, I'd probably say I would probably use more of a predictive processing model over that. And I don't know if that topic's too big to get into that, but I'll let Quinn talk before I start to ramble off on that. Let, let me, before Quinn does... I called that the words predictive processing would make at least one appearance in this podcast, <laughs> even if we had no questions containing it. You can't it's bring availability it up bias. talk about it. Yeah, it's a um, We're defining central sensitization. I think potentially being misrepresented in this dichotomy, I think it's my understanding that central sensitization is not necessarily synonymous with a psychosomatic issue. So I think when we, we hear central sensitization, we then think, oh, it's the psychosocial element of pain now. They have, they have now centralized their pain experience. But I've seen central sensitization defined clinically as, let's say somebody's coming in with acute local knee pain. It's mechanical, it's very specific to the spot, it's consistent. And then over time, as it becomes more chronic, it's 
it jumps around but it's not it's not local it's not pinpoint anymore it's more diffuse around the knee or it's like in the back of the knee today it's a side it's a front it's like the the patient becomes less able to describe it with any consistency i've seen central mm -hmm. sensitization defined as that process which is still perceived as peripheral by the patient it's still their knee but but the mental i, I guess the the description of central sensitization is that now the the sense the mental map of the sensory map is now more kind of diffuse and broad like if you wear a glove on your hand the brain map is now one big representation of your hand your hand is now just one finger instead of five digits over over time something like that so <clears throat> i think it's a false dichotomy per peripheral sensitization versus versus central sensitization. I think it comes down to what both of you have said is ultimately, what do they want to do? What can they do currently? How can we bridge that? And it doesn't really matter. You just take the symptoms as they are and it, it doesn't necessarily make a difference. I don't know if there's any valid way to differentiate because I don't think that those terms are defined well enough to create that type of dichotomy. And then I don't think that we have interventions that are specific to central sensitization versus specific to peripheral sensitization. And if we do want to make it central sensitization is more synonymous with uh, the psychosocial side of things, then, okay, we're measuring, we can measure fear avoidance with certain questionnaires. We can, we can ask them about their, um, you know, anxiousness or kinesiophobia. We can measure that with certain questionnaires again, but does that ultimately change what we do? I don't, I don't think, I don't know. I don't think the answer is, is yes with any definity. <clears throat> so that's kind of my thought on it. I think we need better definitions of these things before we can parse out different assessment tools and ultimately intervention tools. Now, predictive processing. <laughs> Tell us everything, Mike. I, I don't know anything about it, but um, I mean, in terms of this peripheral versus central sensitization, I, I think it's, it could be a really easy compromise when you start to use a model like predictive processing, which looks at what are the top-down influences from the central nervous system and what are the bottoms-up influences from like the sensory information um, coming in from the environment or coming in from the body. And I, I have a better time rationali rationalizing that approach in my head because I and this may not be a parallel to central versus peripheral sensitization, but, you know, if someone is coming to me and, like you said, they've had, you know, multiple year chronic knee pain history and, you know, through the interview, I'm understanding their beliefs and maybe they have some maladaptive beliefs and some avoidance of activity and, you know, maybe they've been fed some imaging information that they kind of perseverate on. Then, then I'm thinking, like, all right, they have a very strong top-down model of what their knee is and that's changed over time and context is very significant in this episode and that's why maybe the knee pain is kind of weird and uncertain and kind of random pattern it doesn't really like fit a specific like location like pin that you can pinpoint and for someone like that i'm like well they're still gonna need some peripheral or bottoms up stimulation from exercise or movement but they're also going to need like top down, you know, reconceptualization, top down reframing to, or else it's not going to match up. You know, like my, my argument is like PT can't be done like under anesthesia or like PT, you know, like you can't, you can't like knock somebody out and give it and make them rem forget like, you know, what they did in the sessions or they're also, they're probably not going to have like that positive outcome. So it, it needs to be like this conscious event with this kind of unconscious kind of or non-conscious um, peripheral input that you're providing through hopefully movement. Um, and that's what kind of makes sense to me. And I think that the predictive processing model maybe has that compromise with some of the brain centric and kind of peripheral centric um, models that we've kind of battled back and forth over the years. Does that make any sense? <laughs> it totally does. I'm just, no, 100%. I'm just trying to think is it's like, is peripheral synonymous, peripheral sensitization synonymous with bottom up and essential sensitization synonymous with top down? I don't I don't think so. Yeah. No, I, I think I think if Yeah, I think if, if Lorma Mosley 
kind of was listening to this conversation, he'd like kick the door down and tell us <laughs> that we're talking about it kind of maybe a little too generally. But um, it, yeah, it, it's just a way that it helps me think better clinically. And I, and as I kind of explore the literature on, on it more, I understand it has limitations because it's a little bit theoretical right now, but um, I'm at least like inquisitive on kind of seeing where it, where it leads us. So it gives you a mental representation of the clinical picture, kind of what? Yes, I think it accounts well for like both, again, again like if you had to dichotomize two camps of people that were treating pain by looking at it mostly through like a brain kind of centric realm or like almost like a anatomical, I think it can kind of people on like either side of the pole or closer to closer to either side of the pole. Would you say that you address like in your mind, so mental representation of a clinician, I'm you know, kind of addressing top down, bottom up, top down is like education, expectations, reframing, mm -hmm. sub subjective, you know, non-specific things, therapeutic alliance. Yeah, all of exactly. these really, really important things that are hard to measure, and then you know that peripheral stimulus st stimulation is 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 the exercise itself. But you're not; those two things aren't separated. Because no. yeah, I mean, even the exercise can have like can affect top down processing, right? You can show somebody that they they can do something that they didn't think they could do. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and I think that's why it comes it comes down to like what matters clinically, and again, like learning about it, I think gives us like conviction and like more understanding of like how can we frame it for the patient or the uh, individual, and and then hopefully like that paints a better like clinical treatment session that like you're more direct and that you're kind of trimming the fat, like the stuff that doesn't matter as much. Because like, I mean, over the years, I feel like I'm I'm doing less and less and less and less with my treatments, and I I see that as a good thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hopefully.